and I'm very pleased to have back on the show today one of my great guests from South Africa. We've just had a great conversation and we thought we'd better start recording the show. And uh, this is Stephen Mitford Goodson and I'm going to bring him up right now. Stephen, are you with me? Yes. Hello, Andrew. Thank you for having me again. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to come back on. I mean, the last show that we did uh, on the boards, I mean, that was a joy to do because I love covering history. I really do. And especially if you can get such a complete account as you put together that anyone who is complete unaware of that subject could literally listen to that show and have a great education in it by the end of it so that was one of my real favorites and today uh, your background essentially is in in finance you're a real expert and I've got the uh, title of the show the trials and tribulations of exposing the central banking scam because this essentially is something that you've done Uh, and so what I'd like to start with is your background into how you got into finance leading into Uh, your experiences that led you to expose this scam, how you exposed it. Uh, So if we run through that first, and then we can go into what's happened to you as a result of you, you know, exposing these people behind the scenes. So go ahead, please. Yes, well, I first became aware of there being a a, a banking financial problem um, quite some while ago. It was in the 1970s when I I was living in Rhodesia. Uh, I read a journal called Rhodesian property and finance. And the editor, Wilfred Brooks, uh, he appeared to be aware of this problem and he had a, had a column which uh, he re- <clears throat> reprinted from the Financial Times by a journalist by the name of C. Gordon Tether. And he wrote about the Bilderbergers and this uh, uh, um, secret financial group. And um, funny enough, this journalist was Shortly thereafter, he was fired by the editor of the uh, Financial Times, Eddie Fisher. But nonetheless, this just um, pricked my interest, and uh, I started reading up about the various banking. And um, something that had always puzzled me, and that was from when I was at, at, at school, um, history was one of my favorite subjects, and I could never understand what was the cause of World War II. Um, you know, the... We're told it was because that of Germany's invasion of Poland and uh, a conquest of that country, but that just didn't seem to add up. And um, it was only when I found out that, that Germany had uh, changed its banking system so that it could be free from the international bankers, it could print its own and create its own money, and uh, it uh, was able to conduct at least half its trade by means of barter, that's bypassing the uh, international payment system. And I became aware of the fact that it was for financial reasons that uh, Germany was forced into a war. And a few years later, I I, I pondered the the question of Japan. I thought, well, why was Japan um, forced into World War II? And and I came up with the identical uh, reasons, which were that that Japan had uh, adopted the social credit policies of Major C.H. Douglas after a lecture tour in 1929. And they had also had, they had also introduced a similar system to Germany of uh, creating their own money with their own uh, state bank, and they became enormously pr- prosperous as a result thereof. In Germany's case, the gross domestic product increased by 11% per annum, and in um, Japan, it's even higher, about 25%. And it's for this reason that these two countries, and Italy as well, which also had a state banking since 1936, had to be destroyed. So that might be that was my sort of introduction to uh, understanding what what was behind the uh, World War Two, and the uh, the reason was, of course, that they had transgressed the uh, the banking system, the the fractional reserve system, which had been instituted by the Rothschilds as far back as the uh, beginning of the 19th century. Yes, and it's funny because you raised the point about um, Germany's invasion of Poland at the start of World War II. Well, that was what we were told we had to go into World War II as a result of. And then at the end of World War II, you had Russia or the Soviet Union occupying all of the uh, east of that country. And there was no requirement for us to have any further war to return back to Poland. So I think that you can look at history and see what Henry Ford said, that it's bunk uh, and it's just what they want to tell us but uh, certainly I mean if, if you talk us through your the roles that you had in finance that gave you the information because I understand that you were 
uh, I think that your position was uh, not renewed or something. I don't think you were directly forced out. Can you go through that for us, please? Well, uh, at, at the time when I was in Rhodesia, I was working for a merchant bank, and I had a number of positions uh, as a portfolio man- in manager, investment manager of, in, of investment portfolios, and I worked for um, life assurance companies, um, a short-term insurer and, 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 and a stockbroker. Uh, so that gave me the sort of background of how the finance works. Uh, in, in 1999, I, with a few friends, established a, a political party, the Abolition of Income Tax and Usury Party, uh, which took part in the national elections. Uh, in South Africa, we don't have uh, individual constituencies. Uh, it, it's all based on proportional representation, which actually gives small parties a, a better chance of getting a representative. Uh, as it turned out, uh, we didn't have much in the way of finance uh, spread our message, but um, we obtained uh, just under 11,000 votes, uh, but we would have needed a minimum of 20,000 in order to secure the seat. And there were, of the 16 parties, we finished uh, not bottom, but we did finish three from the bottom. We uh, were in front of the Socialist Part- Workers' Party and the... Um, and the Greens Party. So that was a sort of, uh, the, the, well, the reason why I was pursuing a political route was not to, not to uh, take a politics as such, but to use it as a um, as a platform in which to uh, promote monetary reform and bring it to the attention of the general public. In the following years, uh, I took part in a few uh, local government elections in Cape Town, three of them, and then uh, in uh, 2014, that's in the last general election, I joined up with the Ubuntu party, uh, which is under the leadership of Michael Tellinger, and I was the second candidate. And uh, we again, we promoted a people state bank uh, to take over the functions of the existing central bank. And we had uh, a very enthusiastic campaign. We had almost a thousand uh, people in the field. You know, we printed T-shirts. We did. Uh, we translated our message into various indigenous languages. We used a, a trailer with a, a big placard. We put up posters all over the country. It was a, a tremendous campaign, and um, but we got very little return. And um, I believe that uh, our votes were were severely diminished. The the, the ballot papers are are tallied in each voting district, and then the, the figures are sent to a central uh, database in Pretoria where they're all collated. And obviously that opens up the um, opportunity for uh, malfeasance. And we know that we were definitely cheated out of one or two. Uh, in one case, uh, this referred to the uh, overseas uh, ballots, uh, and we, there was a representative there, and he noticed that I think there were about... Um, 16,000 votes were cast, and we had 4,000. That's a quarter of them, and we actually saw the power. But when we got our final tally, uh, we received less than 8,000 votes throughout the country, so we knew that we had been targeted. Um, but that comes as no surprise. And most uh, <clears throat> voting systems are tainted in all the boxes, you know, whether it be the United States, France, or anywhere else. So that, that was the sort of... Um, that was the political approach to um, propagandizing the idea of monetary reform. Then, yeah. uh, sorry? No, go ahead, sorry. Yes, well then, in uh, since 1986, I've been a, a shareholder of the South African Reserve Bank, and it, it is one of eight central banks in the world which has a private shareholding. And, um, and in the case of South Africa, half the directors are elected every year, not necessarily all seven of them, but one or three, depending on uh, whose uh, period of office had expired. And um, this offered an opportunity to pre- present oneself as a candidate. If you, um, you didn't even be a shareholder, so I, uh, uh, what actually encouraged me to put myself up for election was that I'd uh, made a, a proposal, a, a special resolution, that the bank should uh, increase the dividend, uh, which had been fixed since 1921 at 10 cents per share, and it obviously it. Um, been greatly devalued by inflation over the years, and that this should be adjusted. And this was well received by the shareholders. And um, I thought, well, seeing that I'm putting this resolution up, I might as well make myself available as a director. And my opponent at that time was recently retired CEO of the largest mining company in the world, a BHP Billiton, Brian Gilbertson. And um, 
contrary to their expectations, I received, uh, well, the resolution received 75% of the votes and I received a, a similar number, a similar percentage. Uh, and that's how I became elected as a director of the Reserve Bank. Uh, I was elected for three years and um, I, I took the, what I thought the most prudent option was not to be controversial or to uh, rock the boat, as it were. And uh, I merely simply applied myself to learning the rules and to uh, making a contribution, and that uh, was accepted. Uh, initially, they did in try to introduce legislation to have me um, excluded, but they dropped that. And by the time the at the end of the three-year period, I was invited to carry out to to uh, make myself available for a further three-year term, and that that was uh, uh, that was repeated after six years. And uh, then in my last period of office, I, I did try to use a, a, a memorandum for the, uh, the board to discuss about reforming the, the South African Reserve Bank so that it could operate on state banking lines, whereby the, uh, the, the Reserve Bank would issue all the country's currency, in other words, nationalizing the money supply. And uh, I, I drew up this memorandum and cited numerous examples of where it had worked in the past and the present. And, but this proposal was not understood by the current governor, then uh, Jill Marcus. She uh, referred it to the senior economist, and he did not understand it, and so the matter just never went forward. And um, so I left after the, my third term, as we were only allowed to serve three terms, and that was where my uh, career at the Reserve back ended. Yes, and um, I understand that you've been under attack uh, since then by various groups on... Um, things you have written about the central banking scam. First, can you tell people uh, in as simple terms as possible what the core of the central banking scam is? Well, the, the central, the, the, uh, the sort of the model central bank is the Bank of England, which was uh, established on the 27th of July, 1694. And that model has been replicated throughout the world. Uh, but central banks didn't take off. Any, uh, it was a long gestation period. And um, the next one was in America. In the American colonies, they issued their own currency, a form of colonial script, which didn't carry interest and was debt-free. And it was <clears throat> this colonial currency drew the attention of the Bank of England. And they realized that they were losing control over the American colonies. And so they instructed the uh, colonies to import their currency from England, and this uh, was not done effectively. In fact, they didn't get the amounts they needed, and this caused a huge slump in North America and uh, huge unemployment, and was the principal cause of the American Revolution. You know, the war ended in 1783, and already two years prior to that, the uh, a Bank of North America had been set up, which was a central bank modeled on the Bank of England, and this bank. Uh, was replaced in 1791 by the First Bank of the United States, largely foreign control central bank. And once again, uh, it, its uh, banner was not renewed after 20 years in 1811, but it was a second bank of the United States was established in 1816. So t central banks did not really uh, come in uh, operation on a large scale during the 19th century. And that in 1900, there were only 18 countries which had adopted central banks. And most of them were in Europe, but there were also central banks in Japan, United States, um, Indonesia, and the rest were all in Europe. It was only after World War I, which was partly fought to uh, destroy all the, the major empires of Austria, Germany, Russia, and Turkey, to all to split them up into smaller states, which would be more easily uh, um, amenable to the setting up of central banks. And there was a conference in Genoa in uh, March, April 1922, where this whole matter was discussed by the government of the central banks of France, Britain, Germany, and America, and it was decided that all countries should bank. And the purpose of a central bank ostensibly is to, you know, print the, uh, print the notes and mint the coin and uh, to uh, supervise the banks, ensure that there's stability in the economy. But that is really only a, a, a small part of the, their overall responsibility. The principal reason you have a central bank is so that it permits the commercial banks to create the, the uh, country's currency uh, as an interest-earning debt. And uh, this is why one of the uh, 
principal uh, objects of, of, of central banking is to uh, undermine the, the power of government and to allow all power to rest with the uh, commercial banks. One of the pillars of, of central banking is well known is that they must be independent and this independence allegedly and enables them to act in a neutral way but that is simply not the, the, the truth. Uh, they are independent of governments and their people but they're not independent of the commercial banks and um, it's, you know, it's, it's a, an example of the tail wagging the dog and the uh, central banks are there to serve the, of the private banks and to allow them to create all the money except for the notes and coin and to therefore enrich themselves and their owners uh, to a really fabulous extent. Yes, and uh, the traditional, well, I don't know if that's even the right word, what we were told was the um, traditional fractional reserve banking model was that these commercial banks could lend out 20 times what they had on deposit. And so... And feel free to jump in if I'm wrong here, but the example I would give is if they had a thousand pounds, then they could lend out twenty. But if they've only got a thousand pounds, where do they get that twenty from? Do they go to the central bank and say, "We've got this on deposit, so we want you to print up another twenty thousand and then lend that up out"? Can you explain the process here, please? Well, what happens is that a a private bank will be required to deposit funds, liquid funds, cash or treasury bills sometimes government, short-dated government stock with the central bank and they will earn interest on that money. So, for example, if they've got 100 million pounds uh, on deposit, uh, then they can lend out a billion pounds. So how it works is very simple. Uh, all that happens is that, for example, if you go to a commercial bank and ask for a housing loan, and uh, I don't know the situation in England, but I would imagine that housing loans form... Well, I know in South Africa they form 50% of their loan book and probably a similar amount in England, uh, possibly even more, 70%. So this is a, a very uh, cogent example. You go to the, the bank and you ask, you want to buy a house for a million pounds and the bank will check your uh, employment references, your income stream and so forth. And if they feel that you are capable of repaying the capital plus the rest and other sundry charges, they will grant you a loan. Now, in the mind of the borrower, you are now asking the bank transfer a million pounds from Joe Smith's savings account to your loan to your mortgage account, and the bank will charge you, for example, five percent on your uh, loan, and uh, the person you're borrowing from his savings account, he will be getting, so we say, three percent. So that two percent would represent the margin of profit. Um, commercial bank is making on the on the on the on the loan, but it doesn't actually work like that. All the bank does it credits your account with a million pounds. So in the bank's balance sheet, it will now have an asset of one million pounds. But now where's the liability? And this is where the creation process is. In. They create a deposit of one million out of thin air, and then their books balance. They've got a, 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 fic, a fictional deposit of one million pounds and an actual. Uh, um, so, which is a liability, and they have an asset of a million pounds, which they have lent the uh, borrower, and then uh, and they will obviously then charge interest on that money. And uh, the general experience is that during the life, if should we say that, for example, that borrower bought that house when he was at the age of say 25, during the, during his lifetime, the borrower will pay about five times the original initial amount he paid for the house in interest and, co and expense and sundry costs. And um, this is how the banks suck out the wealth of the individual um, and the, the entire population. And it, it also works with other types of loans, you know, car loans or whatever. And, um, and the same principle applies with government. Although government sometimes will tap into uh, existing pool of money, but that money still has been created out of nothing. So governments will, will borrow, shall we say, at uh, currently rates are quite low, 4%, but then in order to, to fund the payment of that interest, they will have to tax the, uh, the people in to, to pay that interest to the bankers. So the bankers have uh, literally, because they, they control the money supply, they control, they control the government and, and its people. Now, how about in the case of, because uh, obviously with a, um, 
a mortgage now, you say they create this fictional deposit and then that presumably, when the house is purchased, uh, that money gets sent to the seller's bank, etc. But how about if you've got a situation where somebody's got a loan for £5,000 and they go into the bank and they just want the £5,000 in cash because they're off to a used car salesman around the corner and they're going to give him £5,000 cash for a car. Where do they actually get, because of course they've got to then physically give you the money? Yes. Well, I mean, they, they do have uh, a small percentage of their assets uh, um, available for for um, dealing with, with customer requirements. Uh, obviously, they don't, that money that they, they have not created themselves, that money has been printed uh, by the Bank of England. Um, so, but, and they pay for that money. Um, they have to pay for the, and, and when those banknotes are, become soiled or unusable, then they get that money refunded. So in that particular case, they would actually have to pay uh, for physical cash. But you must remember that uh, only 3% of all transactions are in cash. So uh, those those uh, disbursements of cash will not really uh, impact on their profitability because the other 97%, the money, that money has been created by them out of nothing. So uh, an example you've given, while it is true that the bank doesn't create that cash out of nothing, it's only, a, it's a, you might say it's a, um, it, it's not a loss, but it's, it's, they, they don't gain anything on that. Yes, it's very interesting because, you see, a, a lot of people think that the model is is that the central bank can just keep printing lots and lots of money and, and uh, so... Uh, a commercial bank goes to them and then they can say we've got this loan and you'll print the money up and what have you but essentially what you're saying is that um, certainly when it's on an electronic or even on the old check basis that as soon as they've got that loan then they just pretend that they've got the uh, exact equivalent on deposit when they haven't uh, and yes. it's only when they require cash transactions uh, that they have to actually go and get the money and they essentially won't make anything on that. Uh, so that's a fascinating um, example that you've given us, a fascinating bit of knowledge, because essentially it really shows that when people say that this bank just creates that money, so you're talking about every commercial bank, so in the UK, if you're going to go to Barclays or HSBC or Lloyd's or what have you, then this is how they will do it when you're getting a mortgage, for for example. And the other thing is, of course, we keep seeing this great big push uh, for cashless society. Um, uh, there was a story recently in the UK, Steve, and um, they want to encourage people to stop paying anyone in cash, uh, maybe your window cleaner, what have you, because he might not pay tax on that money. And uh, we want everything recorded. But it goes to show the level of the greed of these banks, because they're obviously identifying this 3% that they don't want to lose out on, uh, and they're desperate to have that all in cash, and they're doing all sorts of things like um, that new... Uh, contactless payment you know rather than putting your card in the machine and typing in the pin you can have a little chip and you just like dangle it somewhere and i wouldn't do that at all because i would be worried that uh, if i went too close to one of these it might just take money i'd rather have the security of having a pin number but they're pushing all these different things um there's a company in wisconsin i read about recently there's some technic tech company and they're pushing microchips for their employees if they want them it'll go in the skin between your uh, thumb and forefinger uh, and you just scan that to get through doors and also to make payments in the staff canteen etc etc all these things are on the way and um, it's interesting that you said uh, essentially that the cash element is something they're not making of. and so that's another reason why they want to get rid of it would that be a fair uh, assumption yes well um Although only 3% of the actual cash, uh, or the money in circulation created is cash, uh, 30%, about 30% of transactions are still done by means of cash. That's between you and me and, and, and shops and so forth. That's excluding the banks. And the reason why they want to have a cashless society is obviously they can then monitor your spending pattern, but they can extract a, a, a sort of permanent source of, of income, uh, even if they're debit cards. Uh, because they take a percentage of the sales price on every transaction. And I, I know for, for credit cards, um, they can charge a merchant up to 10%, depending on the viability of the business. And this money is actually is being ripped off from the consumer, whereas um, 
if we had an honest money, so we could have, it would only be necessary to charge, shall we say, uh, a fifth of a percent just to run the system. But instead they charge, generally they will take, well, obviously for the big, the big uh, um, supermarkets and so forth, they will, the, the, the charge is probably only around about a percent. But for other merchants, they will charge anything from 2 to 5%. And this is money, for them, this is money for, for old rope. And that's one of the principal reasons why they want to have a cash society. It also suits them because cash is, uh, is cumbersome. I mean, you have to have, you know, extraordinary uh, security arrangements for transferring it from various depots and so forth. Um, but that does will have a slight downside for the central bank, something which uh, they seem to have uh, ignored. Because the, um, when a central bank prints money, physical cash, um, it then it then sells it the, uh, to the commercial banks, who then distribute it to uh, to the public. But uh, they don't own that cash. They, all that what they do is they the cash that they've sold to the uh, private bank, they then invest that money, and the interest on that money uh, helps to defray their running costs. So if they're going to uh, diminish the issue of cash, this, and this is a major um, part of their income, it's going to be severely reduced. So they will have to find some other form of uh, income in order to uh, fund their operation. Right, and uh, of course in America it's very revealing the fact that, uh, I mean, we know the story of the Federal Reserve, the banks that own it, uh, the people behind those banks, and the fact that uh, if you look up a phone book uh, under Federal, and you look for Federal Reserve, it's not in the uh, government section of the phone book, it's in the private section, near Federal Express, uh, for example. But in the UK, we're told that the Bank of England was nationalised, and so now the government owns it. What's the story there? Is it still owned by these? Because I always was led to believe that uh, in order to nationalise it, you have to essentially buy it from someone who owns it. They never just, unless it's uh, in communist uh, uh, Soviet times when they'll just seize people's property. Uh, in mm. the UK, they would have to buy it off the original owners. And I understand that what they did was they had to give them so many bonds that these people still essentially retained control of it and the change was in name only. Can you clarify what the story is there and who actually does have the power over the Bank of England, please, Stephen? Well, in 1946, this was part of uh, Labour's uh, nationalisation programme. Uh, the Bank of England was nationalised, and the shareholders were paid out in bonds that I think it was 12% at that time, and they were redeemed after 20 years. Um, of course, nationalising the, the Bank of England made, made absolutely no difference. Just like they're now moved to nationalise the South African Reserve Bank, all that has changed is the ownership and uh but not the management and the structures. They remain the same. So that nationalization was a sort of a, a symbolic uh, uh, act which uh, made absolutely no difference to the lives of the people who were still under the control of the, the private bank. I believe later on in, in uh, some in the 70s, or eight, there was talk of, of there having been a reverse nationalization of the Bank of England, but uh, I do mention in my book, A History of Central Banking, um, but it's not exactly clear uh, who actually owns the bank today. Thank you for telling me that, because I, I banging my head against a brick wall with that one when I was doing my research many mm -hmm. years ago, and I heard mm -hmm. many people, oh, it was secretly re, uh, you know, bought back or what have you. Um, mm. and, and I couldn't get to the bottom of that story. But essentially what you've said to us is, OK, say it was bought back. And so when you went through the way that central banks make money by printing money, uh, one of them, and that's how they maintain their you know, costs and what have you, uh, that, that's not where the real rip-off is taking place. The real rip-off is the person getting the loan for a bit of a billion pounds and the bank just saying that they've automatically got a billion pounds on deposit, which they haven't got. And this takes us to the story that we hear that if everybody went to a bank in one day to get their money out in cash, that that bank would fold. But then when you look at the small print and that now, if you, for example, wanted to withdraw uh, money from a cash point machine, then they limit you to, you know, I think it depends obviously on your bank. It could be anywhere from 250, 300 pound a day. I think some banks give you 500 or something by special arrangement. And then also, if you look into the small print of uh, how much money can I withdraw each day? 
from a branch and they generally limit you to about £500. And so they've got all these limits in place to ensure that that nightmare scenario does not take place. I've never actually seen that really happen. I mean, obviously, we could look at, you know, situations, you know, in in the war in Germany, we have those stories about um, people someone taking a basket full of money to buy a loaf of bread and someone stole the basket but left the money. Uh, Is there any um, examples of how the public have managed to actually bankrupt a bank through withdrawals alone? Well, that was very prevalent in the United States where they had tens of thousands of banks, you know, in the 19th century, early 20th century. And there were numerous runs on banks when there was when there was the belief that they had uh, run out of cash or run out of uh, gold coin, um, so you know that's uh, you know that was very prevalent. But today, uh, the thing is, you know, the, the, the uh, system is, is much tighter. And if any bank should experience a run, then the others will quickly rally around, and as well as a central bank, and they'll supri- supply all the liquidity they need in order to stave off that that run. Uh, so in today, in the modern world, that 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 really occurs. Yes, and um, that's very interesting. So let's have an example of those. Um, is it just a case... So we're going back to, like, the, the Depression in the 30s and the bank runs, etc. in America. Um, so once that bank is exhausted, they can just say, right, we've gone bust, so anyone who didn't get their money out, well, you've lost it, bye-bye. Is that essentially what happened? Yes, you, you lost your, your deposits or, or whatever you had with the bank. And I mean, there were about over 10,000 banks went bust in uh, the early 19. Uh, thereafter, they tried, they set up the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, which I think today it insures uh, deposits up to $100,000. And um, that uh, is a sort of kind of a safety net, and it has been used in the past. There were a number of banks, uh, and the Franklin Bank was one of them in the 80s that went bust. Uh, and they bail out the, uh, the depositors uh, were bailed out. Uh, of course, that having having such a safety net that also creates the problem of, of moral hazard that people will uh, behave recklessly and talk about banks because they know that there's safety net in there. But the banks actually have to pay for it; um, they have to contribute to it. So uh, I believe most countries have, do have a similar arrangement so that if if, if a bank should f- fall into difficulties, um, the the, the bot- depositors and savers will be bailed out, um, and that that. The, the central banks have always tried to protect the depositors in order to sort of save face and keep the system going. Um, but for the shareholders, uh, that, that usually means that they've lost all their money. Now, going back to the 1930s, so uh, the bank run happens, the bank goes bust, any depositors have lost their deposit, end of story. How about anyone who had a mortgage with that bank that went bust? As there was no bank to keep paying, if they'd have just got a mortgage, did they end up with a free house? Well, what often happened is those bus banks were taken over by other banks, and they would have, because uh, they would have sold whatever. I mean, they, when a bank goes bust, they still, although their net balance is negative, they will still have assets. And what would happen in a case like that is that a bigger bank would have would have taken over those assets, would have paid a, a dollar for the bank, and then uh, would have uh, kept the assets of the bank and, and left the liabilities would just fallen away. So I, I, no, I don't think you would have got a free. Uh, uh, no, that was that's a, but it's a really important point, isn't it, to look at because, mm. you know, mm. I've said that before. It, it's just ridiculous. Um, so mm. the the new bank can just take something over and, and cherry pick mm. all the profitable bits off it and have absolutely yeah. no um, obligation to the people that lost money with that bank. It's just well, it's that's just exactly a what scam. happened with Lehman Brothers when they went bust. They, all the all the good parts were taken over by various other banks. I think Barclays even took over a portion of Lehman Brothers. Um, but the the shareholders and, and, and others who were in, you know invested, they lost everything. Well, it makes you wonder if uh, they all get together and they say, right, we've got a load of bad liabilities here, and you've got those here, and so what we'll do is we'll gradually funnel them all to Lehman Brothers. We'll bust that. And then we'll mm. cherry pick the bits the, the bits that we want, and we therefore, uh, you know, survive without these horrible liabilities. Do you think that's very possible? Oh, indeed, I'm sure it happens all the time. Yeah, it's you know, it, it's just they won't give. They're so greedy. They won't just say, well, you know, the bank went bust, so. 
the deposits, uh, we can't pay the depositors, but, you know, if you just got a house with these people, you're lucky. Uh, because yeah. it's like, no, no, we, we'll make sure that we get everything. Every, every little uh, avenue they've got covered mm. uh, in order to... Uh, and, and it all is based upon the fact that they create money out of thin air. And it's the commercial banks that are allowed to do it. And this... Um, was this 20%... This Sorry, this uh, being allowed to loan out 20 times what you had on deposit. Was that mm. ever was that ever true, or was it just used as an example? Yes, no, it was definitely true. It was, in fact, uh, up to 1989 in Japan, they only had to have 2%. Uh, you, could, you could borrow 50 times. And that was when they introduced the Basel I regulations, uh, changed it to uh, 10%. And that's why uh, Japan was, um, was precipitated into a recession from which it really has never recovered. Uh, and uh, as a result of the uh, fiasco in 2007-2008, in March uh, 2019, under the Basel III regulations, the um, uh, reserves which a bank must, a, a private bank must hold with the central bank, have been increased to 14%. Um, so uh, that has actually, although it seems like it's a good move to tighten up the lending system, the, the downside is that less money is going to be created. And the whole, the whole money supply is predicated on banks creating new loans because when a loan is repaid or simply uh, reneged on, that means that money is being withdrawn from them. And that's why we have this constant growth. That we've got to grow. We've got to lend money in order to keep the money supply up. Uh, and uh, if we don't do that, then there will be a deflation. So that, that was one of the reasons why they, well, they lent all this money out after 2008 to all the banks to pump up their balance sheet at very favourable rates of interest of 1% or whatever. But the, the consumer didn't benefit from that, and that's why uh, growth, so-called, has been anemic over the last 10 years. And uh, it's because the, uh, the, uh, the banks cannot create more money uh, for loans because there's not a sufficient demand. Yeah, um, I'm just running through this in my mind, because on the amount that they have to have on deposit before they can make loans, if someone comes into the bank and they want to borrow a million pounds for a house, so they agree, and then they lend them the million and they just write that they've had an invisible deposit of a million, and then the next person comes in, he wants the same thing, the next person, next person, then every time that they're lending out a million, they're also giving themselves an invisible deposit of a million. And so essentially, it's only going to be uh, the cash reserves, wouldn't it, that are dependent on this... Uh, what you gave the example of the 14% that you have to have on reserve, because all the other money, every time that they're uh, giving it out, they're saying that they got a deposit of that amount. Yes, they can create up to, up to 10 times, well, a, a bit less under the 14% rule. That also, also depends on the kind of um, asset that you're talking about. Currently, um, the existing system where the, the, uh, the average must be 10%, for properties only 7%, and that will increase to 10% uh, from... Uh, March 2019. Yes, and that would be another indicator of why the house prices in the UK have been pushed up and up and up and up and up. I mean, it's just absolutely mm. ridiculous. You know, now yes. the average salary in the UK is about 25000 and the average house price is about uh, uh, 220000 So, you know, you're yes. talking about over, well, nearly nine nine times well nine times basically mm, your salary mm, mm. and this is nine times the average salary for the average property uh it's yes. absolute lunacy but of course yeah. they need to keep doing that because they need all this money and the only way that they the banks can can stay afloat is when someone comes in essentially a mortgage is what they want to give out something where they can or a personal loan in which the the individuals just sending the money somewhere else electronically because it's just something that they mm. created out of nothing uh and so it makes sense for the banks to uh to you know encourage inflation uh and now we're in a situation though where the interest rates as you pointed out earlier in the show are so low because they've pushed everything up so high so they can't push it too much more because people won't be able to afford anything because the employers aren't paying and uh, it makes me wonder if these FDIC regulations, I think in the UK it's something like £80,000. So that would be similar now to about uh, $100,000 because uh, mm. the pound and the dollar are quite a bit closer together than they were since Brexit. Um, yes. So 
we keep hearing about a potential crash coming up because of this quantitative easing or QE they've changed it to and what have you, where they just keep printing more and more money. Uh, what are your views on that? Is, is there a crash imminent? Uh, go through that for us, please. Well, I mean, a crash has been predicted for, well, certainly since uh, 1971 when America went off the gold exchange standard. Um, but, you know, these, these central banks and the ultimate controlling bank, the Bank for International Settlements, have been very deft at uh, deferring uh, any such uh, circumstance happening. Uh, at present, the, um, it's obvious that this uh, quantitative easing has, has boosted the money supply, uh, but it hasn't, cre- hasn't um, boosted economic growth. And the, the problem arises now is that when they get off this quantitative easing, when they stop creating money uh, and interest rates rise, uh, then we're going to have a, a major problem, and that could precipitate a, uh, a, a major slump. You know, if, if you look over, I mean, the, um, uh, the U.S. debt is, is almost from the time when uh, Obama uh, was elected in uh, 2008, the, uh, the U.S. debt doubled from nine trillion to 18 trillion, and um, you know, this doubling of every eight or ten years is unsustainable because eventually the interest payable on this debt. Uh, will consume more than half the budget. So there's, there's, there's obviously there's a cap to this. Can't just go. You know, it, it, it's unsustainable, and eventually it will cease. The um, and as it stands, the the stock exchange is hopelessly uh, overvalued. It's bloated. And if you look on the price earnings ratio, I mean, it's well above the average of I think it's 27. The average is about 15. And but if you take the the 10 year average, it's even worse. Uh, so the, definitely there is. You know something brewing, but they say they've been very skillful in the past in avoiding a major calamity. Um, but uh, it may be not that far off away. Yeah, it sounds a bit like Yellowstone. You know, it could go at any time, but it's uh, it's kept going yeah. all this time without uh, erupting. Mm. It's literally it, it, you could equate it to something like that. I mean, um, mm. if they keep produ- why would they stop producing this money if it's serving their purpose? And it's like, well, you know, this debt's there and this debt's getting bigger and what have you. Well, the bankers depend on debt. The most important thing to a banker is not to pay the principal, just to keep paying the interest. Yes. So, you know, we will see in time. But um, we've got a few minutes left and I'm I'm conscious. I mean, this has just been, you know, has absolutely taken the cake for me for a, a... an easy to understand way that the banking system works and i hope that the listeners appreciate it as much as i do because it really has been useful and it's clarified things for me uh as what you said it's the commercial banks that are that are doing the printing of money because people always say it's the federal reserve that's doing it it's the bank of england but you've you've really um and of course they're printing money they're printing physical currency but that's really nugatory when you, you compare it to the electronic currency that's printed or currency paid by cheque or anything like that, that they just write that deposit and a, a bank on the street, your Barclays, your HSBC can just do that. But um, yeah. you've come under attack and the title of the show is The Trials and Tribulations and this is based upon, can you run through what has happened to you? Who has been attacking you? Uh, what these attacks have involved uh, against you, just to to let the listeners know who the bad guys really are out there and what they're trying to shut you up from saying. Yes, well, about um, three months ago, uh, I was contacted by the uh, public protector. Um, and she wanted to, well, she asked me if I, if I could assist with a investigation into a uh, a banking scandal of a, which took place uh, between 1985 and 1995. And um, I, I, I wrote back and said, look, unfortunately, I wasn't at the Reserve Bank during that time. And, uh, you know, I'm unable to give any first-hand information, but, uh, you, know, you know, thanks for contacting me. But then a few days later, I was contacted again by a sister. said, no, please, she would like to meet me, which I duly did. And um, she told me that she'd read my book, uh, Inside the South African Reserve Bank, It's Origin Exposed, which, by the way, is available on Amazon. Um, and um, she said she found it a very interesting book and that she would like to uh, introduce the uh, monetary reform proposals contained in that book. So I was quite uh, taken aback, but uh, she was genuine and she seemed to have grasped the essentials. And, uh, you know, we discussed uh, various aspects. And um, and then, they, you know, we had a bit of correspondence and so forth. And we didn't actually agree, but we I, I, what seemed to be the way forward was that it 
that uh, the public protector would uh, discuss it with her, uh, with uh, other government colleagues, and that they would, um, um, you know, take take the matter forward. Possibly uh, towards the end of the year, when the African National Congress has its uh, uh, its annual get together, and um, I thought that was where the matter would would rest. Um, but when she issued her report on the 19th of June, she mentioned well about the obviously the claim for the. Uh, money which was stolen many years ago by a, a, a former subsidiary of ABSA Bank. And also she said that the mandate of the central bank she uh, changed from uh, merely protecting the value of the currency and in the interest of sustainable growth, but rather to promote uh, the uh, growth in the economy uh, in the interest of the people. And um, she was severely attacked uh, by the central bank and other bankers and the media, which sort of acted in unison. And... Uh, she did, uh, I don't say unfortunately, but she, she quoted me as a source in her report. And the uh, media latched, latched onto this and uh, they uh, tried to, tried to uh, present me as being a, uh, you know, someone whose ideas are not acceptable and that uh, she had been unwise to consult with. And it um, seems now that she is going to withdraw that proposal. Um, the central bank instituted a, uh, a review of her decision, and it is going to court, and uh, was APSA Bank disputed her um, allegations that they still owed money. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I was subject to numerous uh, you know, personal attacks in the media, and uh, you know, as a result of my association with her report, and it, uh, it went on for a couple of weeks, but it sort of died down now. Right, well, that's very interesting, and... Um... Did it make the mainstream media these attacks on you directly, your name directly? Oh yes, no, it was in all the all the major newspapers, and um, um, and it was mentioned on radio and and also television. But I, no one ever consulted me or asked for my opinion. Uh, you know, it was just taken as read that my my point of view wasn't worthy of any uh, inclusion, except for uh, uh, about nine days ago, I was invited on a talk program for half an hour it's one of the major tv stations invited me and i was able there to uh, express my views it's um if anyone wants to look it up it's, it's called um, straight talk it was on the uh, 16th of july and um you just type in my name and you can stephen goodson and you can just listen to it if you're interested it'll give you some interesting uh, background as to what it's all about and, and and the role of the central bank and what needs to be done to reform it Excellent, and I will include a link to that. I've made a note, uh, and also a link to your book, um, give the full title, Inside the South African Reserve Bank, Its Origins and Secrets Exposed. I'll give a link to that on Amazon.com. Is there any other website? And there's also, also a history of central banking, because it is a, a companion volume, which actually helps one to understand the, the Reserve Bank book better. If you've had that, um, you know, if, if you've read that book, uh, and both book, I mean, the, the history of central banking has just been up, updated, and uh, I've just just finished uh, the German translation of that book has just been. And so that would be the Amazon.de site. So I know I get some listeners yes. over in Germany. And um, is it best to go direct to Amazon, or do you have a particular website that you offer it through as well? Or? No, no, it's only available at the it's only available at Amazon okay, or excellent. Barnes and Noble, or, or I mean, you know, you can look around. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you could probably find in some bookshops too if you inquire. Yeah, and, and one of my listeners, uh, David, over in Australia, he recently ordered a book by a guest I had on. He just went to his local bookshop and just ordered it through there. So, uh, yeah. you know, that that is still, if you've got a, a bookshop that's connected to the uh, global channels, whatever they are, then they can always get hold of these items. Um, yes, well, Amazon, Amazon through Ingrams is, is represented in the UK, uh, North America, Australia, New Zealand. Right, that's interesting. Now, um, is there anything else? Can I hand back to you for a closing statement? Anything else you'd like to promote? Anything that you'd like to tell the audience? And uh, then we can wrap the show up. Yes, well, I, I think we're living in very interesting times, uh, to use that cliche. Um, and I do believe that um, as the, uh, the economic crisis unfolds, it's going to create more awareness and also more opportunities. Um, I believe the, although the internet has its downsides, it has helped in creating more awareness of what is going on. And I believe we have, this is probably our best chance of uh, 
trying to wrest control back from the bankers who have been uh, controlling us now for more than two centuries. And certainly if, if we don't take the initiative, um, we can look to a very bleak future. Yes, and just one thing that came to my mind, Stephen, is, of course, all this mass immigration that we're having pushed into Europe. Uh, these people are, are would be in a position at some point, if they're going to get employment, to be able to go to a bank and say, I've got a job, give me some money, and then they can carry on their scam with these people. Is that one of the reasons you think that the mass immigration is taking place? Well, the mass immigration relates really back to decolonisation, which started in a in 1960. Um, Prior to 1960, Africa was one of the more prosperous areas of the world. I mean, there was uh, no shortage of food. There was, you know, there was prosperity. Um, But after the bankers decided to uh, get rid of the colonial powers, they um, opted for the option of exploiting them through international loans. And they've done it very effectively so that many countries uh, spend 100% of their export earnings on paying interest. And this, of course, has... uh, largely undermined their economies, uh, brought about the uh, lack of prosperity and the need for people to immigrate and and find a greener pasture. Excellent. And um, I want to thank uh, Monica Stone uh, at the end of this show for um, pointing out situations, etc., in South Africa and the situation that you were under. And uh, this has just been a fantastic show on uh, central banking. And I, I read read watched the money masters film several times but for me you've explained it uh, in the simplest way i've ever heard today so thank you so much for joining me today Stephen. well thank you for having me andrew and i hope to be on your show again yes and Stephen is uh, one of the board of contributing editors of the barnes review there's only a few uh, and uh, indeed Stephen, you're always welcome just shoot me an email what have you and uh, we'll do a show on anything that you'd like to discuss thank you Right, well, that's the show for today, folks. So I want to thank everyone for listening. I'll be back with you all soon, and bye.